All right, it's time for more, more of Peter McKenzie. And he's going to be coming and talking about some IoT related things here because he's going to talk about the protocol BLE. And BLE is used for a lot of different things. One of those things is, of course, IoT communications. It's also used for peripheral device connectivity. It's used for locationing. There are a lot of things it can be used for. And he has some very special information for us today about BLE. So, Peter, take it away. Hello, my name is Peter McKenzie, and today I'm going to be talking to you about BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, versus Wi-Fi. Why talk about it? Um, there's so many air up technologies competing in the IoT world. You think of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Fred, Wireless Heart, Sigfox, Z-Wave, the list goes on and on. And it's a bit of a minefield when you're trying to choose the correct app technology for a particular IoT use case. So why did I pick BLE and Wi-Fi to talk about out of all the options? Well, it's because they're the two most used and prevalent app technologies. In fact, if you go anywhere in the world where you find people, you will find both Wi-Fi and BLE. I can be, if I up my protocol analyzer, I could be at home, I could be in the office, I could be in a shopping mall, I could be in the airport, and I will be able to capture Wi-Fi and BLE packets. But here's the difference. Everyone in my house, in the office, in the shopping mall, in the airport, they all know what Wi-Fi is, and they all know they're using it. In fact, if Wi-Fi goes off in my house, it's a matter of seconds before I'm being screamed at by at least two people. In fact, Sometimes I'll purposely disable my eldest son's Wi-Fi just to get him out downstairs from his bedroom to come down and have tea. And it's amazing how he magically appears when I do that. But I reckon if I said to him, if you don't come downstairs, I'm going to disable your BLE. I don't think it would have the same effect, would it? And although BLE is enabled on everyone's devices, um, most people don't actually know what it is. It's a technology people are using without knowing they're using it. See, when an Apple user uses something like Apple AirDrop or Apple HandOp, or even when they're using their AirPods, they're using BLE. Now, how often do people complain about the Wi-Fi not working or being slow all the time? How often do people complain about BLE? Never. In fact, they don't even know they're using it. It just works. It's the invisible technology everyone's using. Something that someone once said to me about technology is that you know a technology is working well and doing its job if no one notices it. I wonder if BLE is a bit like that. Um, so we're going to get to know BLE a bit better and compare it to a technology we all know well, Wi-Fi. So let's set up talking about Wi-Fi. Um, so Wi-Fi is defined by the IEEE in the 802.11 standard. It's a standard which defines wireless LAN, wireless local area networking. It allows wireless access to the LAN, no longer needing to be tethered to an Ethernet connection, enabling mobility, enabling network connectivity in difficult places to wire. It operates in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And soon it's going to operate in the 6 gigahertz band as well. And we need more frequency. Why? So we can have more channels. More channels, more capacity. More capacity, more aggregate throughput. In fact, increases in performance and throughput has been a theme of the wireless and industry for a number of years. 2009, we saw the introduction of the high throughput physical layer, the 802.11n amendment. And it was all about getting more throughput. Then 2014, we got the very high throughput amendment, even more throughput. And now, 
we have Wi-Fi 6, which makes data transmissions more efficient, more aggregate throughput, better data delivery in a timely manner. You see, Wi-Fi is all about data and file transfer. Transferring data, voice, video, and making sure those applications work. And as we've had advances in our AREP systems and more complex antenna systems and radio chains that we've got to power, the amount of power we need starts increasing and increasing and increasing. We use the power access points of 802.3 AF PoE. And then we started needing to use AT power for our access points. And there's Wi Fi 6 access points today, which now require BT power. So that's Wi Fi. Wi Fi is all about getting data delivered in a timely manner and in and lots of data. And as we do that, and as we get to a point where we can deliver more and more and higher and higher throughput, we need to use more and more and more power. So what about Bluetooth? Well, Bluetooth um, was named after a 10th century Scandinavian king known as Harald Gommerson. The, he was a Viking king who ruled Denmark and Norway. And of his many accomplishments, the one that's probably credited to him as his greatest was the fact that he united Denmark and Norway under his rule. But he was also known for a dead tooth he had, which had gone a very dark gray blue color. And it was so prominent, his nickname became Harold Bluetooth. Now, if we take the initials of his nickname, Harold Bluetooth, in Nordic's rules, which were, and put those two together, we get basically the Bluetooth logo. Um, Bluetooth being a technology that unites communication protocols, allowing mobile phones to communicate with computers. And that's what the original Bluetooth, what we tend to call classic Bluetooth, was all about. A technology which started off being about allowing cell phones to talk to headsets or talk to computers. But then the app market came along and we got smartphones which have downloadable apps and operating systems which can be upgraded. And soon there became this need for a new way of connecting devices up. And when they started writing the BLE spec, they started with a blank sheet of paper. It was a new protocol which would allow a new whole ecosystem of devices to communicate. There's things we can do with BLE, which would be almost impossible with any other app technology. Now, Bluetooth is managed by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, the Bluetooth SIG. And the original SPAC was, was first published in 1989, with the first devices being launched in 1999. But it wasn't until Bluetooth 4.0 SPAC that we got low energy published in 2009. And the first de major device um, to deploy Bluetooth low energy came in 2010, June of 2010, was the iPhone 4. And what this did was open up a huge market for small battery powered devices which could communicate with a smart device. BLE, you see, removed a lot of the complexity and structures from classic Bluetooth and it enabled developers an easy way to connect and exchange data with personal devices. If we look into the um, Bluetooth specification, um, we find that Bluetooth low energy is really there about enabling almost a world of sensors, a world of small battery powered devices which can communicate with smart devices. Um, one of the reasons it can do this is it has a very low duty cycle. Low duty cycle means low power consumption. We can power a BLE radio from a coin cell battery. Its simple de device discovery and connectivity and data exchange results in the fact that the radios don't transmit very often. They spend very little time on the air, therefore they use very little power. It's also de designed to be very short range as well. So when we think about Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is all about data transmission, getting lots of data transmitted. 
BLE is more about state information. Small, sending small amounts of data sent infrequently. So think about a temperature sensor. A temperature sensor might, the only thing it needs to do is every now and again send a temperature reading. That's a small amount of data sent infrequently. BLE, the perfect technology for doing that. So as we come to look at some of the more details of BLE, what do we see? Well, first of all, there's different power classes which we see for BLE. Um, now, although you can see the different power classes and you can see it goes all the way up to power class one, actually, when we look at most of the BLE chipsets, they don't go anywhere near that high. Then normally, a lot of the chips, um, maximum output would be like zero dBm, which is one milliwatt. Some of them might go up to four dBm, but some of them will be down at minus four dBm. And the reason being is that they all want to be able to power from like a 1.5 volt coin cell battery, running at no more than 50 milliamps, although very often it will be less than that. Now, we arrange a BLE network in what we call a stair topology, and it can have virtually unlimited connections, more than 2 billion connections to this stair. And, we can, and BLE has security built into the specification. We can use 128-bit AES CCM encryption. And we do that on, when we transmit data on the data channels. Um, there's 40 different channels specified in BLE. We have um, what we call advertising channels and data channels. We're going to look at those in a minute. But each channel is one megahertz wide with two megahertz space in between the channels. So let's have a look at the channels. Um, now, as we can see up here, we've got our traditional Wi-Fi channels on our 2.4 gigahertz band. Our channels are 1, 6, and 11. And we're all used to seeing our Wi-Fi channels. But what if we had our Bluetooth channels over the top? Let's do that for a second. So Bluetooth, we have 40 channels, um, which we can see there across the entire 2.4 gigahertz band. Each channel being one megahertz wide with two megahertz between center frequencies. Now, you'll also see, as we look up here, you'll see that there is three channels I've done in orange spaced out across the spectrum. Um, these are channels 37, 38, and 39. These three channels are what we call the advertising channels. It's where we're going to send our advertising packets out on. Um, some BLE devices just send advertising channels. They never use data connections. So thinking about B BLE beacons, I beacons, they only send out beacon messages on the advertising channels to be heard by other devices. Now, these advertising channels are not just randomly put in there. They're actually designed so they don't interfere with Wi-Fi. We'll see that channel 37 at the beginning is just before the beginning of channel 1. Channel 38 is between 1 and 6, and channel 39 is beyond the end of channel 11. So if you have an advertising device, it's not going to interfere with your Wi-Fi. Now, if we make a data connection between two devices, it's then going to use adapted adaptive frequency hopping to hop across the data channels. And we're going to talk a bit more about the hopping later on. But these blue channels from 0 to 36 are all my data channels. So when we're thinking about Wi-Fi, when we think about what devices we have in Wi-Fi, we have a client and we have an access point. The client device um, is the device that's going to connect to an AP. Access points advertise themselves through beacon frames, and it's the AP, the central device in the wireless network that sends out the beacons. Clients can try and discover APs with probe requests and probe responses, but it's a client who decides which device to connect to and is initiating the connection through what we call association. What about with BLE? Well, in BLE, we have two devices as well. We have something called a peripheral device, and we have an observer device or a central device. The peripheral device is the one who's going to broadcast out advertisement packets. And 
The peripheral device is more akin to the wireless client, although it's the one sending out advertisements, not like the AP sending out beacons. It's now almost the client doing it. The peripheral device is going to send out advertisements saying, hey, I'm here, you can connect to me. And the central device, the mobile phone, if we're talking about a smart watch and a mobile phone here, is sat there listening to these advertisements and it will be that device which initiates the connection to the smartphone. When it hears an advertisement it likes, it goes, I'm going to connect to you. So it's a little bit reverse to a wireless infrastructure. And when the mobile device um, initiates the connection, it will then be able to send data and then they assume a sort of master-slave role with the central device triggering any data packets that the slave can send. Now we use Anri to this um, state machine. It's the 802.11 wireless LAN state machine and the process the client goes through when it's connected. We've got in, in from state one, it needs to go through 802.11 authentication. Then it's going to go through 802.11 association to get a connection to an AP. And then it may need to go through some backend authentication, maybe 802.1x or using a, a four way handshake to do um, free shared key authentication. And eventually it's going to be connected and authenticated and we can send our packets. What's a BLE stair machine look like? Well, this is a BLE stair machine. Um, we've got five different states, scanning, advertising, initiating and connecting. And then we have a standby state, which is basically a state where it can power down its radios and it can basically um, save energy. And when we're moving between stairs, we often move through the standby state. Now the scanning state is just listening to BLE advertisements is what a central device does. It starts listening to advertisements. The advertising state is when we're sending out advertisements. And then when we initiate a connection, we go into the initiating state. Peripheral devices go from advertising to connected. And when we have um, central devices, they go from the initiating stage to the connected stage. So let's look at the two devices, both the peripheral and the central device, and how they use the state machine. So peripheral devices go from standby to advertising, where they start sending out an advertisement packet on each of the three advertising channels. If they get a connection request, they'll move from advertising to connected. The central device, however, is going to move from standby to scanning where it's listening to advertising packets. If it hears an advertising packet it likes, it will go back into standby, come out of standby into initiating, and it will send an initiation. It will send a connection request. Once it sends the connection request, it then moves into the connected state. Only one packet takes a pair of devices into the connected state. So let's talk a bit more through this process. Let's talk about these advertisement packets that get sent out on the three advertising channels, channels 37, 38, and 39. Now there's four main types of advertising packets. And there's um, two reasons you're gonna send advertisement packets. The first one is you're sending out an advertisement packet with the, um, because you want to establish a connection. You want a device, a central device to connect to you. So you can exchange data. So this would be like a smartwatch sending out advertisement packets to a phone. The other reason for sending advertisement packets is you just want to advertise that you exist. And you may contain some data within that advertisement packets. This is what BLE beacons do. They just send out advertisements. And there's data within the advertisement which people listen to. So looking at the four main advertising packets then that we get, um, the, the first one down here, which is a basic advertisement one, it's called, it's a connected unidirectional advertisement. And it's basically saying, hey, you can connect to me, any devices out there, I'm here, connect to me, any central devices. The next one is what we call a directed advertisement. 
connectable directed advertisement packet. And it basically, you send it to one particular device and my Apple Watch might send it to my iPhone saying, hey, you can connect to me. Not anyone, but you only. And then we have um, a packet called it advertising non-connect, um, non-connectable unidirectional advertising packet. And this packet is like what a beacon would do, like an eye beacon. It sends out an advertisement, says, you can connect to me, I'm just sending out this information so you can pick up my presence. And then we also have something called a scannable unidirectional advertising. It's saying, you can connect to me, you can just listen to my beacons, but if you want to send a scan request, I'll give you a bit more details. So I've got more data which I'm able to send. So let's have a look at how this advertising procedure goes on then. So we've got a peripheral device, which you can see here um, at the top of its escape screen, and it's sending out an advertisement packet. It sends out advertisement packets on each of the three channels, channel 37, 38, and 39. And it spends less than 10 milliseconds on each channel. So it sends out advertisement within 10 milliseconds, then it moves to channel 36, sends out the same advertisement message. This time on channel 38, it gets a scan request back saying, okay, that's great information. Can you give me a bit more? I need a bit more information. So it sends a scan response. And again, all within less than 10 seconds, and it moves on to channel 39 and sends out the next advertisement packet. So that's advertising. What about when we want to exchange data? Well, there's two types of data exchange in BLE. We have what we would class as advertisements only. These are unidirectional broadcast data. Um, think about a beacon, like an eye beacon or some battery powered beacon. It's just sending out beacon advertisement packets and whatever information is contained within that beacon is the only data it communicates. Nothing can send data back to it. Um, contained within that can be proprietary manufacturer, proprietary data elements in there. Um, so it can contain data in there. There's a wealth of data that can actually be communicated in an advertisement packet, but it's just one way. The other way we can exchange data is where we actually get two devices get connected. There is a connection request in response to an advertisement packet, and then those two devices will then move to using the data channels to communicate data across the network. So let's have a look at how that's done. So we can see here, you'll see I've got a peripheral device. It sends out an advertisement packet and it receives back from a central device. This is on channel 37 of one of the advertisement channels, a connect request. Once it receives that packet, it's only one packet, those two devices are then connected. They enter the connection state of our state machine. There's then a gap of around 150 um, microseconds. Um, well, it changes to using its data channels. And then we have a master slave arrangement where it sends, the master sends a data packet, which then allows the slave to send a data packet. And we get a master data packet, slave data packet. And it can do that until it's decided to finish data. Now in reality, very often you get one master, one slave, and then they're done. Once they've done communicating data, they will then go to sleep. And they will, and how long they go to sleep is all communicated very often in information the connection request. They talk, they communicate what's called a clock accuracy with one another. Um, and then they know how long to sleep for. But they'll go to sleep and then they will wake up, move to a different data channel and do the same thing again, master, slave. Now, if the master doesn't have any data to transmit, it may send a null packet and then the slave will respond. If the slave doesn't have data to send, it will respond with a null packet, but you always get a master data packet and the correct response is a slave data packet. And then it'll go back to sleep, wake up, move channels, it will communicate again and so on and so on. But this whole process to get data transmitted from the connecting to the end of a data exchange on one channel 
can be less than three milliseconds. This whole process, it takes very, very little time. We don't, we're not transmitting for long when BLE connection, so we're using very little power. So much little power that we can power BLE devices from a coin cell battery. 1.5 volt coin cell battery could potentially power BLE radio for 40 years. Now, very often in a battery powered device, it's going to have more than just a BLE radio. It might have a little sensor in there, so that may take up some energy. But if we're just powering a BLE radio, you can do the math and you can get to about 40 years. Well, these batteries don't last 40 years. So we're not limited by when are we going to drain the battery power? We're actually limited by the lifetime of the battery and battery technology. In fact, you can even power BLE radios off solar panels. There's um, done some research on powering BLE radios from very, very small solar power panels, which actually get their energy from the lighting in an indoor environment. So they pick up that they get power from the lights, they power the BLE radio. Um, they've also looked at sort of using scavenged or harvest energy so you can like you know power BLE radio from the vibrations in the back of the car or, or what about if you put a BLE radio in a toothbrush and as you're brushing your teeth the movement of the toothbrush powers the BLE radio and it can start to tell you how long you brush your teeth for when you brush your teeth great for parenting your children come and you go have you brushed your teeth and they go oh yes I did dad you get your phone and you go no, you haven't. Go and do it again. Or it says you brushed it for 10 seconds. I think you need to go back and brush your teeth a bit longer. Um, lots of applications for BLE. Let's look at the protocol because I'm a protocol person. Um, and let's spend a little bit of time looking at the protocol. So first of all, BLE, we're going to look at the format of a BLE advertising frame format. Now, we haven't got time to look at the data frame format as well. Maybe we'll do that in another session or another talk sometime. But we're going to look at um, a couple of things I want to point out in the advertising frame format, which we'll then look in an analyzer at the detail form. Um, the first thing I want to point out is this thing called a PDU type. It's in the PDU header. And it tells us what type of advertising frame it is. So if it's a, you know, an advertising packet, one of the four types we've already talked about, um, it'll tell us that. So is it a scanning request or scanning response? Or is it the connection request if we're in the initiating stage? But another little flag I want to look at is something called a TX address. And the TX address is interesting because we've got um, two values. Obviously, it can be a zero or one. It's a one-bit flag. Zero means it's going to be using a public MAC address the burnt in manufacturer MAC address. But if it's, if it's set to one, it means it's using a random MAC address. It's not using its manufacturer MAC address, it's using a randomized MAC address so that it becomes harder to track the devices. And we'll have a bit of a look at it in Wireshark in, um, a, in a few seconds actually time. Um, and that's before we do that, let's just look at the next part, which is the PDU payload. Now, if it was a directed advertisement packet to a particular device, you've only got two fields. We've got what we call the advertising address. That's either the public or the random address of the device sending it. And then the target address, who are we sending there to? And we're saying, hey, will you connect to me? That's basically what we're saying in this packet. In other advertising packets, we have the advertising address, either the public or the random, and then we get a data element. The data element contain what we call advertising structures. You can think of these if you're used to looking at wireless packet files, they're a bit like information elements. And there's many information elements or advertising structures defined in the standard. They have a length, a type, and then the data. But you can also get manufacturer specific AD structures where manufacturers can put their own data structures in here. And we're going to have a look at that a little bit in its next section. So that's what we're seeing here. Let's take a look at it then in 
um, Wireshark and have a look at some packets that we might see. So here we are inside Wireshark with a BLE packet catcher. I captured a little bit earlier. And I want to show you some interesting things we see within here based upon what we just looked at. I'm just going to take one of the BLE advertising packets. We can see the type of advertising. In fact, it's a connection advertising one coming in. And we can see it's from an Apple device. Well, how do we know that? Well, if we look in this BLE packet, which we can see here, we are going to start to see, we can see the BLE type. We talked about that. Also look at the TX address. It's telling us it's using a random address. And then in the advertising data, we can see there's three of these different advertising structures. There's one called flags, has a length of two and some flags. There's one called power levels, length of two and some power levels. And then there's a manufacturer specific one with a length of 11. And inside here, there's a company ID and it's Apple. So I said we wanted to have a look at all the Apple devices that we had here. Now, uh, so I'm just going to, and you can see I've got the company ID here in the column as well. But I'm just going to right click and I'm just going to apply a filter. So now we've got all the Apple devices. Now, when I started its capture, I had my iPhone as the only Apple device I owned turned on. And then later I turned on my Apple Watch because I wanted to capture the interaction between them. Now we'll see here something that's really interesting. We can see it's using a random MAC address. So this MAC address here is not the real MAC address. Now inside the company information, you'll see there's a data element as well. Um, so I'm just gonna add the data element as a column here. So let's apply as column. Great. So we'll make some of these columns a bit smaller so we can fit everything on. Now you can see here that although I'm using a random MAC address, this data is the same. Now the first byte of the data, which is one zero, is telling me it's um, a particular Apple type called nearby. It's using the Apple nearby service. That's what zero one means. And the rest of it is a unique ID of my device. Um, and as we scroll down here, I, I want us to look at, you'll see that I had my iPhone very near my sniffer, minus 17. So if I did like pick up my wife's phone, which I think I did here, it's minus 86. I know it's a different device. But looking at this device and looking at its the MAC addresses, you will notice that here, the MAC address changes. It's still got a strong signal strength, but this is my iPhone changing to a different random MAC address. But look at the data element, it stayed the same. So if we look at the data element and we look over time, we can actually track the changes of MAC address. Now, Apple or not do also randomize the data. And we see actually not long after the MAC address changes, it changes the same MAC address that it's changed to, but it's changed to a different data element. But because those changes don't happen at the same time, I'm able to follow the randomization MAC address through and check which device it is. Um, and then I see some packets that have a zero C at the beginning. And zero C means the Apple handoff um, protocols working. So it's the same device, but it's just doing some different protocols. And as we come down here, we start to at some point see two different MAC addresses. Um, and its second MAC address, we're seeing these two different data elements, the two different MAC addresses. That's when I turn my watch on. Now let's have a quick look at what happens when I turn my watch on. Um, I'm just going to take our filter off because I don't want to filter just on those advertising packets. I want to filter on um, all the packets that we have within this trace file. Now, I'm just going to have to bear with me a second while I find what I want to show you here. So, what we capture here is when my 
watch turns on. What we'll see is we see there's an advertisement packet. Now this is coming from my watch. I know because of the signal strength and following through the MAC addresses, I'm not gonna go through that whole process with you. And then we see a connection request from my phone, the stronger signal strength. And if we look in this, it tells us some quite interesting information. Um, let me show you a, a couple of things in here about going into too much data to some of the things we see. But we will see um, it, one of the interesting things is it, um, the clock accuracy to do with the sleep accuracy, but it also talks about a hot pattern. We see it's got this pattern six, hot pattern six. So when we go into the data transmissions, which we get here, the first channel we see it using is channel six. And there's a packet from the master from my watch and a packet comes back from my, sorry, packet from the phone and a packet back from the watch. We're not gonna go into what all the data is on channel six. Then it goes to sleep for a bit and pops up on, if we do channel six and add six, we get 12. It pops up on channel 12. A data packet from my phone, a data packet from the watch. Then it goes six more channels on, 18. And you can see this hot pattern, it enters two data packets, and then it hops to channel 24, six more channels, then from 24 to 30, and then from 30 to 36, then from 36, it's got right to the end of the band, it goes to five, and then six more from five to 11, and so on. So we see how, it's hard to see how this BLE works. It's got this hot pattern arranged in the connection requests, and now it's following that as it's moving channels. Now, I would love to tell you more about BLE, um, but I'm hoping you've got a bit of a flavor of it in this talk. But as I'm already over time, we're gonna stop there, um, and hopefully that was interesting. Thank you very much for listening. Well, here we are once again with Mr. McKinsey. Peter, welcome back again. Hello, thank you for having me back again. Excellent. I, I hope you got some sleep between the last time we talked and now. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, small amount. <laughs> Excellent. And I hear you're looking forward to possibly some shepherd's pie for dinner. I, I am indeed, yes. Uh, that's something that I wish I could just get over there real quick somehow and join you for dinner tonight. I love <laughs> shepherd's pie. Oh, and I bet it's good. a whole lot better when your wife makes it. Uh, it's, it is indeed, yes. Very good. <laughs> All right. So we have a few questions coming in here. Um, uh, questions around security, you know, related to BLE. Um, there are questions about the authentication processes and so forth. Uh, for example, Jennifer asks, um, the Wi-Fi example had the authentication parts described. What's the process between advertising and connect for BLE with the approval auth component? And I know that's a big topic, but Anything you want to talk about related to that today or other BLE security things? Yeah, um, a bit, so security is a massive topic for um, security for BLE. So I think as we start to, um, I think probably what, what, it'd be great to have a full session on BLE security, but the biggest sort of um, attack factor is actually when you pair two BLE devices together um, is probably where the biggest security risk is. It, it is got potential to be open to a man in the middle attacks um, or having someone pairing with a device and, and pretending to be sort of like an evil twin. Um, now there is, there is some security built into it um, and it depends a little bit what BLE version you're talking about. So there's BLE 4.0 and 4.1 devices use um, so something which tends to get referred to as LE legacy pairing. Um, where they basically exchange a, a temporary key and then use that to generate what's called a short-term key. Um, but that's now being sort of replaced in sort of BLE 4.2 devices, which can do, well, it does basically a key exchange at the point of um, connection. Um, it uses an elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman public key exchange. If people are familiar with that. Um, so that would be the that would be the security method to go to. Uh, but I think with a lot of these IoT solutions, it's um, 
Well, the, the security is there in the in the specifications, but it's whether people choose to implement it or not. So, so you can implement yeah. really in a really insecure way, or you can implement it in a secure way. Um, yeah, but it's that's not true. That's true with a lot of these protocols. And there are yeah. several other questions in the Q and A panel, but we're short on time today to get into too many of them. So. What I'd like to do is just take a moment to thank you for all of the effort that you've put in. Uh, two presentations, a lot harder than one. And uh, just so everybody knows, uh, you had to put in a lot of time to get those ready for us. And I do appreciate it. Thank you very much for doing it. And thanks for being with us again today, Peter, and enjoy that shepherd's pie. I will do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All Cheers, right, Tom. take care.